Oh, that was pitiful. Good morning, everyone. That's a little bit better. Good to see you here today. Happy St. Nicholas Day. You may not remember or know that, but today is December 6th. is the Feast of St. Nicholas. If you haven't had a chance to read your email devotional, I encourage you to do that today. Uh, because poor Nicholas has gotten transformed so much into this character that we forget who he originally was. And he was a great man of God. He was a, a bishop, a leader of the church. He also suffered for his faith. He was a great theologian. Uh, many miracles are according to him. He really was a, truly a powerful man of God. So uh, read about Nicholas today. If you were in many countries in Europe, in Hungary, Germany, uh, Czech Republic, places like that, uh, if you were a child, you would have put your shoes out last night outside your bedroom door and awakened this morning and there would have been uh, candy and cookies and toys and little things, little treats filling your shoes. And uh, you would have also left out um, straw for St. Nicholas's horse as he goes around taking treats to kids. So Today, of course, is the second Sunday of Advent, the season of preparation and anticipation, looking forward to the coming of the Savior, whose birth we celebrate on Christmas. And then, of course, the, after that is the 12 days of Christmas. That's the actual Christmas season. And uh, we are continuing our series of God with us. And today we'll be looking at God with us in the wilderness. Before we do that, though, let's look at our our theme scripture for this entire series, Matthew 1, 23, Matthew quoting the prophecy of Isaiah, the, I found in Isaiah 14, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. We, of course, use this name for Christ uh, during the Christmas season based on this prophecy, I think it's sort of a shame, though, we don't use it much during the rest of the year. Because what a comforting, uh, powerful thought that God is with us. Uh, one of my favorite stories about this name for Christ is in the 1960s, during the height of the Cultural Revolution in China, which was Mao Zedong basically trying to refashion the whole country. It was a radical time of change in China, and the church was part of his program. Basically, he wanted to get rid of it. And the church was suffering a great deal of persecution. And I remember that there were many people praying for China. And one story I heard is people were wondering, what's going on with the Chinese Christians? And finally, a group of Christians managed to sneak out a, a, a message to the outside world, to the church outside of China. It was just one word. Emmanuel. In the midst of their suffering and their pain, their persecution, martyrs for the faith, literally giving their lives for the gospel. The message they wanted the outside world to hear was, God is with us. Emmanuel. What a beautiful story. It's a reminder that no matter what we go through in life, and uh, what we experience, that God is with us. For me to tear up in a Sharing a message is not unusual. I don't usually do it this early. <laughs> Maybe I've gotten it out of the way. <clears throat> so God is with us in the wilderness. Let's talk for a moment. What is a wilderness? What are we talking about? So we make sure we understand. And something you may not have heard defined this way, but I think we probably all experienced it. Uh, in the natural world, wilderness is a place that is wild. It is a wild place. It's a wilderness. It's dangerous. It's Oftentimes uninhabited by humans or many humans. It can be scary. It can be barren. Uh, it's, those, it's those wild places of life that just sometimes can cause fear in our hearts. You know, when I was young, I, I could walk a lot more than I do now. I love to go walking in the woods. I still love to be out in the woods. But there's sometimes you get into a very, very dense forest, and it gets a little spooky. You know, and you think of how many uh, nursery uh, fairy tales are about people being lost. There was Hansel and Gretel. There are witches in the woods. You know, uh, Little Red Riding Hood. You go out in the woods, you might encounter a wolf who's ready to devour you. 
there's something about the wilderness that is a little bit frightening to us. Well, when you think of the wilderness in, in, in Jesus' day or in the biblical times, the wilderness was not woods. It was the desert. It was the area outside inhabited Israel. And it was rocky and sandy and hot and dry and barren. It was totally lifeless. And when we talk about wilderness experiences in our Christian life, that's sort of the picture I think we have to call to mind. You ever get to those places where you feel spiritually dry, barren, desolate? Um, it's just those, those times in your walk with Christ where the Lord doesn't seem fresh and real and alive. You may be wondering, is he there? Is he present for you at all? It's those tough times, those hard times when just praying or reading your Bible or going to church is a struggle, a challenge. You ever been there? You just don't feel his presence like you used to. And the question may arise, why? Why do we go through wilderness experiences? If God is Emmanuel, he's always with us. Why do we go through those times of barrenness, of seeming lifelessness, of, of dryness? Why do we go through the wilderness? How do we end up there? Well, when I, when I look at scripture, I, I see, I think there are basically two main causes for how we end up in the wilderness. Two ways we end up there. One is we put ourselves in the wilderness. And two is God puts us in the wilderness. And the experience may be very similar, but who is causing it to happen and the end result can be very different. So let's look at this. Let's look at, first of all, the times we put ourselves in orders. Now, there are times we go through challenging, difficult times in our life, especially our spiritual walk, and we're the, the culprit. Uh, we, we could say, my bad, literally. Mea culpa, my fault. I'm the one who did it. Uh, because sometimes we enter the wilderness, and this is your first blank there, through disobedience. We enter the wilderness through disobedience. And I think, of course, probably the, the, the image that comes to most of our minds when we talk about wilderness experiences is ancient Israel after they left Egypt. Let me just remind you a little bit of the story. They left Egypt, they uh, went to Sinai, received the commandments, made a covenant with God, and they're getting ready to enter the promised land. And so they send out 12 spies, one spy from each tribe of Israel. And they go in and they, they uh, surveil the land, see what's there, scout out things. And when they come back to the spies, Joshua and Caleb says, oh man, there's a lot there. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's beautiful. Yeah, there's some challenges, but God's going to give us victory. We're going to win. We're going to, we can go in and conquer the land. Ten spies, though, say there are giants there. There's some hard places there. There's some overwhelming circumstances there. We cannot conquer there. And sad to say, the entire people side with the ten spies instead of Jacob, uh, excuse me, instead of Joshua and Caleb. And they say, why did God call us out of this wilderness place and, and, and then he's going to take us to a place where we'll all be killed by these giants and all these you know, great enemies against us? And so they rebel and they disobey God because God's will was for them to go straight into the promised land. And they disobey, they doubt God, they distrust God. And so God comes to them and he is very angry at their disobedience and he says this to them. This is found... In Numbers chapter 14, beginning verse 26, he says, The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. Go down to verse 34. And he, he pronounces a judgment on them. He says, They're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explore the land. The spies have been gone for 40 days. You will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. Can you imagine? That's, that's pretty strong language. When you get God against you, I mean, 
There are a lot of people I don't want to have against me, but I certainly know what the Lord against me. To have you would know, you would discover what it's like when God is against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community which have banded together against me. They will meet their end in the wilderness. Here they would die. And another place he talks about that all the, the, the mature adults of Israel, everybody who's over the age of 20 is going to die. An entire generation is going to be wiped out. He's going to apportion a judgment of 40 years, one day for each day the spies were in the land. And that was not only be a, an appropriate judgment for the time they were spying out the land, but also we get time for an entire generation to pass away completely. And God will start fresh with a new generation. So for 40 years, and that's what the book of Numbers is mainly all about. It, it doesn't give a lot of details, but it, it recounts to us that for 40 years, they just traveled in circles. You ever been there? <laughs> you, you ever had that kind of experience in your, your walk with Jesus? You just feel like you're going around in circles? Well, I can't tell you why that happens. It could be. And one thing you should, if you're going into a wilderness experience, one thing you should ask yourself, have I disobeyed? Have I lost confidence in God? Have I done something where God has allowed me to go into this wilderness experience? And it hasn't been my own disobedience. Now, you know, a lot of times, you know, if you're talking to somebody or you're going through a wilderness experience and you're trying to figure out what's going on, you might think, you know, I've sinned. Well, that shouldn't necessarily be our default position. We automatically go, okay, sin has put me here. But I think probably one of the first things we should ask ourselves is, have I sinned? God, if I have, show me. Or if you know you have, sometimes you're in that wilderness and you know why you're there. You know what you did. Israel, Israel knew what they did. They denied God, they disobeyed Him, they displayed a lack of trust and confidence in Him, and they grumbled and complained. It spent 40 years basically grumbling and complaining against Him. So God said, okay, that entire generation is going to die in the wilderness. And that's a pretty drastic wilderness. Uh, good news for you today is you don't have to die in the wilderness. <laughs> we can show a way out, okay? Now, uh, let me say one thing here about that, though. Because the theme of this series is Emmanuel, God is with us. Even though Israel entered the wilderness and wandered the wilderness for 40 years because of their disobedience and their sin, God did not abandon them. He was still with them. He traveled with them. In fact, he traveled with them in a most dramatic way. During the day, they could see a column of cloud over the tabernacle, over the Holy of Holies. And at night, this is a pillar of fire. They had their very own divine nightlight. And he was with them constantly. And he provided for them. He took care of them. In fact, listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 18 as God describes uh, his, his work among the children of Israel. And let me say this as I begin to read this. You know, some people think that the, the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is the difference between law and grace. And you sort of, some people seem to have ideas like law was in effect, and this is what law was all about, and then suddenly here in the New Testament we have grace. Look, I tell you, there has never been a time in human history since the Garden of Eden that we haven't been under the grace of God. If it hadn't been for the grace of God, he would have killed Adam and Eve off at the beginning, and you and I wouldn't even be here. It was grace. It was grace that kept them from going back in the Garden. And eating the tree of life. Because it would be a horrible thing to live forever in this sinful condition. Can you imagine the, the way you are right now with all the pain and aches and suffering and, and hardship and everything else. And guilt and shame of your sin to live like that for eternity. It was the grace of God that kept them from going back to the tree. And God's grace was with Israel. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 18. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. This is when the end of the time is winding up and they're getting ready to go into the promised land. To humble you and test you in order to know what was in your heart. Whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you. He miraculously provided food for them. Manna, quail, and other things. Which neither you nor your ancestors had known. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone. 
but on every word that comes in the mouth of God. Your clothes did not wear out. Now the ladies would hate that. You can go to your closet and you have no excuse. You can say, I, I have nothing new to wear and you wouldn't. You've been wearing the same thing for 35 years. Wouldn't you hate that? Okay, be honest, ladies, you would. Your clothes never wore out and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. God kept them. He provided for them. So I can tell you, even if you're going through wounds experience because of your own sin, God's not going to abandon you. One of my favorite verses of scripture, we, we studied this a few weeks ago in our Wednesday night uh, study of 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy says, if we are faithless, he still remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. He can't deny who he is. He's going to be faithful. Well, there is a way out of this. If you're in a wilderness experience, and it's because of your disobedience, there's a way out, and it's pretty simple, really. The way out is repentance. The way out is repentance. It is to own up to your sin. It is to admit your disobedience. It is to humble yourself before God and say, God, I've blown it. I've sinned. Forgive me. I want to make it right with you. Your wilderness experience can end with repentance. Now, sometimes like it was with the children of Israel, it still is a process. But that's the way out, repentance. The second way that we sometimes put ourselves in the wilderness is we enter the wilderness through stress. Some ways, somehow or another, we come into a stressful situation. And because of what we do, we enter wilderness. Now, this could be weariness or fatigue or overwork or taking on too many responsibilities or not saying no or not finding balance in your life or just the stress and anxiety of life itself. I think one of the primary examples of this is the prophet Elijah. You may remember the story. God called him to meet with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and have a confrontation a showdown to demonstrate who is God. And all the prophets of Baal were there. And they, they built that altar, put the, the sacrifice in the altar, they poured water over it. Well, excuse me, they didn't do that first, the Baal. They, they built the altar, and all day long, the prophets of Baal cried out to Baal over and over and over. And Elijah just made fun of them. I mean, frankly, when, when you really read what Elijah said, you know, remove your spiritual, you know, filters, and look at what he said. He's been very snarky. He was just totally sarcastic. Oh, where is he at? Wait, maybe he's gone. Maybe he lived in Hebrew. He says, maybe he's gone the way to relieve himself. <laughs> you know, where, where, is, where is Baal? And so Elijah comes, he puts water poured on it, and it fills it up, soaks the sacrifice, calls on the Lord of heaven, and God answers the fire, burns up the sacrifice. Great day of victory. The pinnacle, the apex of Elijah's ministry. And then he hears a word. The queen, Ahab's wife Jezebel, is out to kill him. She's gunning for him. And he becomes despondent and discouraged. He's probably worn out. He's been active in ministry anyway. He's had this huge confrontation, this mountaintop experience. I think a lot of times anxiety comes right after mountaintop experiences with God. We talked last week about being in the valley. A lot of times you go straight from the mountain down to the valley. You know? And, and, and Elijah was there and he was despondent and he ran and he hid from Jezebel. And in 1 Kings 19, it says, beginning with verse 3, Then Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. So he chose to go into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Okay, God, I don't want to commit suicide, but I want you to kill me. <laughs> I want you to do away with me. Just take me right now. I've had enough. You've been there. You push and you push. You go and you go and you go. You're worn out. You're weary. It could be a ministry. It could be what you're going through with your family. It could be work experiences. It could just be life. And then what often happens as it happened with Elijah in the midst of that stressful time, bad news comes your way. And you just plummet. You have no energy. You're overwhelmed by fatigue. You're just completely 
overwhelmed with care and worry, and you go into the wilderness. Well, what is the way out of that kind of experience? We've all been there. We all, there are times, you know, there are a lot of times when, when and I know Pastor Paul can say the same thing, somebody comes for counseling, and they're, they're going through basically a wilderness. They're, they're dry spiritually. They're struggling. They're having a hard time. And oftentimes, what is revealed in talking with them is simply they're overworked or overstressed, or there's a lot of family issues or financial woes or whatever. It's something that life has just gotten to them and they're in this wilderness because of the stresses of life. What's the answer to that? How do you deal with that? Well, again, it may be a process to come out, but let me tell you, the way out of that kind of wilderness is an encounter with God. What you need when you're stressed beyond measure, when you're pushed and you don't know where to go to and how to turn, what you need is to seek God with all your heart. Listen to what happened to Elijah. Elijah's there. He's out in the wilderness. God, again, supernaturally, the wilderness provide for him. He sent ravens to bring him food. And he, there was a brook there. But he caused the brook to dry up and the ravens quit coming and God just was compelling him to leave that place. And he sent him away to Mount Hor, which is another name for Mount Sinai, the place where the law was given. It was over a thousand miles away. He journeyed hundreds and hundreds of miles to go to Sinai. And there he goes, and we, we know the story. He's up there in this mountain. And in, and in 1 Kings 19, begin verse 12, And the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And there was a great and powerful wind that tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. Now, that's a powerful wind to shatter rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire. But God was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. A still, small voice. You know, a lot of times when you're in the wilderness experience, and I know a lot of people do this. You want something dramatic to happen. You know, I see people in wilderness go chasing after every evangelist or every faith healer or every new preacher that comes to town they hear about. You know, I can remember years ago knowing somebody that was going through basically a wilderness experience and they heard something was happening down in Atlanta and they drove from Richmond to Atlanta just to go to this service hoping they would find that earthquake. And sometimes God in his grace does that. But I can tell you, more than anything else, you don't need some cataclysmic encounter. You just see, need to be in his presence. Simply, quietly. You know, a lot of times the, the, the best remedy for being in the wilderness when you're stressed and anxious and full of care and fearful is simply be quiet. In the presence of God. Let the stillness of his presence just sort of seep into your soul. You're in the midst of chaos and confusion and noise and clamor all around us. Sometimes we just need quiet. We just need to be, to quiet our hearts, to, to be still and know that he is God. So if you're going through the wilderness then and it's just the, the, the anxieties of life that have brought this on you, I, I would encourage you to seek him. He says, I will be found by you when you seek for me with all your heart. Seek him and seek that place where you can just experience the quietness of the Lord. So sometimes we put ourselves in wilderness. Either disobedience or just the stresses and cares of life put us there. There are times, though, where we see in Scripture that God actually puts people in the wilderness. And I, I think there are several reasons why this occurs. First of all, sometimes God puts us in the wilderness for ministry purposes. Sometimes we go through those hard times, those struggling times, those challenging times, because as God wants us to be able to help somebody else. Consider John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
This is he who has spoken through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling, where? In the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a, a leather belt around his waist. He was, he was dressed up for the wilderness. His food was locust and wild honey. Imagine eating grasshoppers and honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. He was in the wilderness because God knew that's where he could meet people and minister to their needs. Sometimes you go into wilderness experience because God wants you to go to where people are hurting, having hard times, suffering, afflicted, struggling. Sometimes it's in the wilderness that you meet the people that God wants you to minister to. You know, I, I sometimes think, if Jesus were to come back today in the flesh, where do you think he'd go? Well, on Sunday morning, or, or maybe, maybe Saturday, he might go to church. But where would he be the rest of the week? Now, now I, I hope I'm not going to totally blow your mind here, but I'm a, he might be at a party. He might go to a bar, a tavern. Because he would go where it was a wilderness with hurting people. He would go where there are people who need to hear somebody loves them. God loves them. You see, it, it, that's kind of a dangerous kind of thing. I can remember when we were living in Pennsylvania, and I was an associate pastor at a church there. And uh, uh, in our community, we, we were a small community. But in that small township, Henry Clay Township, there were one, two, three, four bars. And we had a real problem. We had a, we had a problem with drunk driving and a number of people who had been killed in that area. Uh, there was a lot of domestic violence. There was a lot of things going on. We actually, our church launched a campaign to have our township declared dry. It didn't pass. Uh, I won't go into rigging elections. <clears throat> uh, but there was a real problem there. And there was one place that was the worst place of all. It was called Traveler's Rest. And it was despicable. I mean, it was, it was a low, seedy, scummy place. And I can remember, I, I cannot even remember the man's name who owned Traveler's, but I can remember God put him in my heart. And I would occasionally see him out in the communities of a guest, and God began to stir my heart. And, and, and one day, it just the, the compelling of the Spirit became so strong that I went to Traveler's. And went in and talked with him and said, listen, I don't know if you know who I am. And he did because I helped work on the campaign to make the township dry. He said, yeah, I know who you are. You're the preacher over the road here. And I, and I talked to him. I said, well, you know, I, I know we were sort of opposite ends of this whole situation and everything else. And, 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 and you know, we, we don't travel in the same kind of circles. But I want you to know, you've been on my heart. And I, I just feel compelled to come and tell you, God loves you. He loves you so much. He sent his son to die on the cross. And, and it, it, was, it was amazing to me that this, this hard, tough, harsh man, I could see a softening in his voice and in his face and hear it in his voice. And he listened. And he actually thanked me. Now, I gave him an opportunity. I said, I can pray with you right now, and you can make things right with God right now. Now, if you'll pray with me. No, no, no. He said, no, I'm, I'm not really interested. But, but you know, I, I saw it. I thought, God, if nothing else, this man has heard the gospel. At least one time I know of, he's heard the gospel. Now, to tell you the other half of the story, I came out, I must confess, when I was coming out, I got in my car rather quickly and drove away rather hurriedly. And unbeknownst to me, it took a few weeks for it to filter back to me through the grapevine. Somebody from the church had seen me coming out of Travelers. And some people were wondering, why is Victor going into Travelers? Because sometimes you go into the wilderness because there are people there who are hurting and need to hear a message of hope and in love. 
I can remember years ago when I worked at A&M the first time, there was a, uh, a man, I, I still remember his ministry, Agustin River Tribal Mission. And he worked on the banks of the Agustin River in, in, in Mindanao Island. And much of Mindanao Island, which is one of the southern larger islands in, in the Philippines, is, is much of it is predominantly Muslim. It's a very hard place. And that's one of those places where Christian missionaries go into villages in Mindanao, they don't come out alive. I mean, it's literally that kind of environment. And God called him to minister to these people along the Agusan River, among the tribal peoples there. And I can remember doing one update for him, and somebody asked him, why are you there? And this is his answer. Because God has put a love in my heart for this hard place. God has put a love in my heart for this hard place. What's the way out of being in wilderness for this reason? There may be no way out. You may struggle through hardship and difficulty, sometimes wondering even if God is there. He is, because he's promised I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. He is Emmanuel, God with us. But you may be put in a place where God says, I want you there because there are people in the wilderness who need to hear of my love. So sometimes the wilderness is a place God calls you permanently, or at least for a time or a season. Uh, don't run from that. Don't fear that. Because his promise is, I will be with you in that hard place. Secondly, sometimes God puts us in the wilderness for preparation. He is getting us ready for something. And, and there are really sort of two categories of him doing this. One is, as we we'll go back and look at Israel again, because Sometimes the preparation is for those who are the disobedient. He is preparing them. You see, God's will for Israel was they would leave the promised land, he'd make a covenant with them, give them the law, and then they would go in and conquer the land. That was what God really wanted. But they weren't ready for it. That's why they disobeyed. They weren't spiritual in place. That whole generation had to die out because they weren't the ones who were ready to enter into the blessings of God, to experience the promised land, to conquer for the Lord. So God let that generation die out and prepared another generation that would be ready. Going back again to Deuteronomy chapter 8, look at what the Lord says here. Verse 2 again, then we're going to skip down to verse 5. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way to the wilderness this 40 years? Why? To humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart and whether or not you would keep his commands. Verse 5. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks and streams, <coughs> excuse me, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and the hills. Now, for the children of Israel, spending 40 years wandering around in desert places, hard, rocky land, dry, barren, lifeless land, that image of a land flowing with rivers and streams and and, and, and just an abundance of vegetation well, was probably beyond their imagination. But God says, I want you to experience that. <clears throat> but your parents weren't ready for it. But I have spent 40 years getting you ready. Yes, Israel ended up in the wilderness because of lack of obedience, of sin, rejecting God. But God says, I do want you to enter the promised land, so I'm going to get you ready. I'm going to prepare you. And he used 40 years of wandering to prepare them to experience the blessings of God. You may be going through a wilderness experience because God is getting you ready to experience something great in him. The way out is that if there is disobedience, is repentance. And but secondly, right on the heels of repentance is trust. See, that's what he says here. You didn't trust me. You didn't believe me. You didn't take me at my word. You doubted what I said. I said, I will take you to the promised land. I will give you victory. You will live in that land. You didn't believe me. 
So I'm going to test you and prove you. I am going to discipline you and train you. So you will be prepared. You know, in, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about the discipline of the Lord. And talks about, you know, the Lord disciplines us like a father disciplines his child. He said, no discipline for the moment is pleasant. What kid likes being spanked? What kid likes being put in time out or ground or having privileges taken away? Nobody likes discipline. But it, it produces a, a, a fruit of righteousness in us. Sometimes God works on you in your wilderness times because he's preparing you to experience great things for him. And even more, sometimes he lets you go into wilderness experiences because he's preparing you to do great things for him. What about the faithful servant, one who's not disobedient? Well, there's nobody who is more an example of this than Jesus. We know he was sinless, completely obedient, never one time failed to comply with his father's will. Yet, look at Mark chapter 1, verse 11. A voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. So here we start off. This is not because of sin. This is not because of disobedience. Here is the son of God, approved by God, loved by God. God saying, I am on your side. You are my favor. You are my grace. And verse 12, at once, immediately after this, this voice of approval from God, at once the spirit sent him into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. So here we have Christ. He was sent into the wilderness. Why? Because he was getting ready to do the greatest work that any man had ever done or could do on the face of the earth. God was preparing him. He spent 40 years fasting, praying, seeking his father, being tempted. Be prepared. Be made ready. Can I tell you, if you're going through Will's experience, and maybe God is getting you ready for some great thing to do for him. You may be going through a very hard time right now. It doesn't matter what kind of a wilderness experience it is. It could be family. It could be work. It could be financial. It could be just a personal struggle spiritually. But whatever it is, it may be that God is getting you ready to do something great for him. Let that wilderness experience turn to a positive force in your life that God uses. You know, sometimes you experience God's presence most dramatically in the wilderness. Think of Israel again. Think of others sometimes. So, what's the conclusion of the matter? Let me assure you, if you're in a wilderness, or if you, in the future, go into one, yeah, you, you want to take time and say, okay, God, is there some reason, something I've done, some reason I have put myself here and examine that? Or God, are you the one who has put me in the wilderness? What do you have for me? Know this. Let me assure you, he is Emmanuel. He is always with you. So what do you do? Remain humble before him. That was his instruction to Israel. Trust him, even in the hard times. Learn the lessons he is teaching you. Seek him before anything else. Can I tell you, the wilderness can then be a time of growth and training in your life. Like going through the valley, the wilderness can be one of the most Profoundly maturing, disciplining, training, growing times in your life. There's a woman named Marlena Graves who's written a book about going through hard times, and she called the book A Beautiful Disaster. And she talks about wilderness. And this is a rather long quote, but I want you to listen to me because I, I thought this, this, these are such beautiful words, such powerful words. 
about what can happen in, in our wilderness experiences. She writes, the spiritual desert wilderness is harsh and wild and uncontrollable, barely inhabitable and yet breathtakingly beautiful, inarguably dangerous and possibly deadly, but also transformational and even miraculous, solitary and unfamiliar, but full of grace and spiritual activity. The desert is a blessing disguised as a curse, a study in contrast. While the theophanies, the appearances of God, and divine epiphanies regularly occur there, so do unimaginable times of depression and despair. We hear many voices and sometimes have difficulty distinguishing between God's, our own, the world's, and that of devils who are toying with us, meaning to eat us alive. The desert heightens our senses. Paradoxically, we actually become acutely aware of both God's presence and his seeming absence. Truths, once obscure or mentally said to yet not experienced, suddenly stand out in sharp relief, while the superfluous recedes to the background. In the desert wilderness, miracles happen. Temptations lure, and judgment occurs. Wow. You know, you've heard our pastor say many times about different things in the Christian life that it's not a matter of either or, that it's so often both and. And that's the way the wilderness, I think God means for it to be, a both and. Sometimes we put ourselves there, sometimes he put us there. It's not easy, it's hard. It's a struggle, it's challenging, it's difficult. It's easy to want to quit. It's easy to want to just throw up your hand and say, I've had it. Be like Elijah. God, take me home. But the wilderness can be a place of great, profound encounters with God. And you can experience some of the most beautiful experiences of the Lord in the wilderness. Let's pray. Father, God, I I am like many here. We've all gone through wilderness experiences, Lord. And Lord, they're not easy, they're not fun, they're not enjoyable at all. But God, they can be so beneficial. And we can learn about you in ways we can learn about you no other place. God, I don't, I don't know what people are going through right here. Lord, I just have this sense in my heart that there's some that they're struggling with the wilderness right now, Father. That life seems barren. You seem far away. There's questions, there's doubts, there's wondering. God, I pray that right now you would come to my brothers and sisters in their place of barrenness, of emptiness, of dryness, and you bring living water. You bring a fresh breeze. You would bring, Father, the, the reality of your presence. Let them know you are Emmanuel. You are God with us, Lord. God, help us in our wilderness experiences. And help us, Lord, that these be times when we grow closer to you than ever before. Learn more about you. And be used of you in greater ways because of it, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Victor. What uh, what incredible lessons to know about being in the wilderness. Um, I I am challenged. I am challenged by that. Just knowing that my stress puts me in the wilderness a lot. And. Uh, and I think I wind up sometimes in those places um, where I'm struggling and saying, God, help me. And I realize I'm there because maybe not even sin, but, but the stress of life puts you there. I was waiting for that way out of ministry and he left us with nothing there. It's a bunch of question marks. Uh, but how true is that? That... Uh, that I don't have to tell Annie we're having lunch at a bar somewhere today, I guess. 
Victor said. <laughs> That's where we ought to go. I, I do believe, and I think Victor would agree with me on this, that if you if you feel God leading, you better make sure that's God leading you to those kind Amen. of wilderness. Right. There's a lot of places you can go that can get you to put you in places of of temptation that God hasn't designed. Right. Notice even when He sent Jesus into the wilderness, He did it on purpose. Um, Jesus reached into that same verse Victor read about the wilderness. I think it's amazing that Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. And Jesus quotes the scripture from when they were in the wilderness. Yeah. And he says, yeah, I could make these stones of bread, but it is written. And he quotes that verse. God has said, it is not good for man to live by bread alone. You know, he, or Satan tries to twist that verse and Jesus kind of puts it back on it. And uh, I, 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 that just t teaches us that <laughs> Satan is, can't create. He can only distort what God's done. There's nothing new. He, he will come at you with the same thing. That's why the Bible, God's word is so powerful because the answers are all there. There's nothing he'll come at you with that he didn't come at somebody there with. It's all there. It's there for us to learn. I, I want you to respond today. There's a lot of great ways to respond with your time. Uh, I want to encourage you to, uh, to respond with one of those challenges on your connection card uh, to, to memorize scripture, to, to accept those, those challenges this week um, that, that deal with the wilderness in our lives. I would encourage you to respond with your time today. As you know, we won't be coming around to collect, but as, as you leave, there'll be a safe place for you to deposit that. Along with your finances, uh, you know, boy, I tell you, the, 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 will, the wilderness that I think a lot of us are facing, a lot of the, our country and, and all the world is facing is that wilderness of, of uh, scarcity. You know, uh, whether it's, I mean, there's some people that, that their problem isn't monetary, but it's literally food. You know, they're not sure where the next meal is coming from. For a lot of us that, that work even work for a living, there's uh, there's that place of is it gonna is the job gonna keep happening? Um, I can tell you, in, in our life, God has seen us through some incredible times in the last few months. But it was a wilderness to look and say, okay, God, I know you're here. I know you're with us. I'm not sure how you're gonna do it, and God has done it over and over and over again. But then there's that. There's that worry that we tend to put on what Jesus said not to do, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. And we tend to do that, which leads to stress, which now I've learned leads us to the wilderness. It's, it's kind of cyclical like that. So I want to encourage you today to give, um, not from a place of abundance per se, unless God's got you there, that's always great, but give out of your love for him and for what he's done, return to him to tithe and then give beyond that. I'll encourage you to give towards our, our giving project. And it's one of the reasons that we always do this in the month of December. When I first felt led to do this several years ago, I felt like, God, that's the worst time. People got more to give to during the month of December than anything else. And this is what I felt the Lord say. Yeah, but most of that is about us. And I want to, we, we talk about it being the season of giving. Let's put that into practice. And let's make sure we know and believe, let's put our faith into practice and so we've been doing this and God has used that to do some incredible things over the last few years. This year, as you know, uh, we're, we're, we're giving towards Bibles for, Korea. last year was China, this year's Korea. Victor talked to you last week about the, the need that's there and it amazes me with all the needs that they have, that's the one thing, it's just like in China, that's the thing they want the most and they need the most. So I encourage you to give towards that. And then as we come to the Lord's table today, in communion. Uh, again, this to me, especially with what we're talking about this, this season, this Advent season, uh, this idea that he is Emmanuel, God with us, there's nothing more to me that shows that than when we come and commune with him and we reassert ourselves that he is with us. For, for you, communion might mean a lot of different things today. For us today, after hearing this message, I, I, I think it's important to to take our eyes for just a couple of seconds off of the wilderness that we are on and remind us that no matter what is happening around us, God is still with us. He is with us. For some of you, your wilderness is, is deeper and harder than others, but we're all in a place of wilderness at times, at different places. I have those, uh, those Elijah moments, generally every Monday morning. It's when I find myself under a bush well, okay, God, 
I'm ready to go, you know. Let's, let's go, I'm ready to go. I'm not quite in the Fred Sanford position, but I'm like, come on, hey, you know. Annie's still here, I think that's why, because I, otherwise I'd be saying, I'm coming, Annie. You know, yeah. um, first time I've ever used a Sanford and Son reference in the middle of communion, that's a new one. So make sure you record that down. It's important for us to understand and to reassure and to build our faith. Victor mentioned this last week, that the entire season of Advent not only celebrates his coming, which we'll celebrate in full on Christmas Day and the 12 days after, but that he is coming again. Advent is a celebration of his coming, period. The fact that he came, the fact that he is coming. And so when we, when we celebrate, to me, this season is the most beautiful time to come to the Lord's table because we celebrate not only that he came, that he came and that he met with his disciples. We, we talk about this every time we come to the Lord's table, the fact that he met with his disciples and he took that bread and he broke it. And he took the, the fruit of the vine and he said, take and, and, and drink of this, take and eat of this is my body, this is my blood. We celebrate the fact that he came but we also celebrate the fact that he is with us. That he is with us. And we also celebrate the fact that we are going to take this. He said, "One until I come, do this until we take of this together when my kingdom comes. So we have that picture of both what Jesus said on the same, what? Yesterday, today, and forever. We'll know, we know that in Revelation, what do they say about him in Revelation? Around the throne. He's the God who was, who is, and who is to come. So today we celebrate the fact that he came, that he broke bread, that he said, this is my covenant. We celebrate in this moment the fact that he is with us. He was both yesterday, he is today, and the fact that we will join with him in forever, that he is coming again. I can't think of a more appropriate time to do that. You've got your, your elements there. I'd ask you to, to undo that top piece. I just want to pray. Lord, we thank you that you came. We thank you that you are with us. And we thank you that you are coming again. Lord, I just ask you to touch hearts today. Anybody that's at home partaking with us in some fashion or here, that, that you would speak to them. And let them know that you want them to follow you. That you want to want them to repent, as Victor said, and trust in you as their Lord, as their Savior, as the supreme ruler, the owner, the authority in their life. We want to change from our direction to your direction and follow after you today. God, we come to your table confessing that, that you are Lord. Lord, I thank you that you took bread that night with your disciples and you broke it. You broke it and you said, take and eat, this is my body. You took that cup and you said, take and drink. This is a, a covenant, this is my blood. I, I'm establishing a new covenant. I, my blood will be shed for you. Lord, I thank you that you, I ask you to bless not only the, these tangible things, this bread and, and juice that we drink today, but bless everything that's responded with today, our time, our finance, ourselves. Let it be used for your kingdom beyond what we're able to do in the natural. God, in return to your people that which you've promised as you bless them as they are obedient to you today. Lord, I thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We give you praise and honor today. He took the bread, he broke it. He said, this is my body, take it. same night he took the cup. He said, this is my blood. Take as often as you do it. Remember me. Take the juice this way. Father, we thank you once again for your sacrifice. We thank you for what you did for us. That you came, that you died, that you rose again. We ask you to be with us this week. Strengthen us this week. Remind us as we are reminded right now physically as we can taste and, and drink of, of these elements. 
Remind us in the same real way this week that you are with us, that you have come to be with us. No matter what our circumstances look like, no matter what the valley, no matter what the wilderness, you be with us this week. We thank you, Father. We, we join together as we, before we leave this place in our benediction from Psalm 1914. And we pray this scripture today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength. God bless you. Be with God today.